Harris Creek, how we doing? Let's go, let's go. When my wife Monica and I, we were first married, we lived in this small, it was like a zero lot line kind of garden home, you know, the honeymoon suite, if you will. It was a small two bedroom house. We, we didn't have kids and I was in uh, working for the corporate world and there were all these shifts that happened in our life. So one is I was called into ministry and so I was gonna go work for the church. She was gonna um, have a baby and so she's pregnant. She's gonna stay at home and we're trying to figure that out and we're processing that with our life group and the consensus is, hey, you need to find a bigger house. The house was, was also very open. It wasn't very conducive to a child or a growing family and her parents would come stay with us and so we were trying to figure out all this, these, these different dynamics and they said, hey, you need to find a bigger house but you need to stay at the same budget. And so we had bought that house, let me give you numbers, they're relevant. Uh, we had bought that house for $197,500. And they said, hey, you need to find a bigger house for, the, you know, that's the ceiling. And so we're looking for a bigger house in North Dallas for under $200,000. And we're basically going into all these bank owned foreclosures, trying to find a deal. There was this really big, weird house, we'll call it the weird house, and it was on the market for like $390,000. And so I walked through and it needed all this, you know, it had black mold and rats and a hole in this living room. And I was like, it's perfect. And, <laughs> and so I made an offer of $185,000 and never even heard back, okay? Less than about half what they were asking. They just walked away. And, uh, and so we couldn't find a house. And so we ended up renting an apartment, moving into an apartment. We had Presley, now we've got a baby. We're living in an apartment. We're doing the thing where you like go to work, come home, and then drive around, look for houses. We're trying to find a house. And it's, we're about six months into this. And I'm really tired. She's at the grocery store. And I'm just like, I'm praying, honestly. I'm like, Lord, where are we gonna live? What are we gonna do? You know, this, we have this short-term lease on this apartment. And I remembered that weird house. And I thought, I wonder what happened to that. And I went in my email and I found the address and I just Google, I found the address and I just Googled it. I was like, I wonder, you just put in the address in Google and it popped up on an auction site that ended, the auction ends the next day, okay? And the next thing you could bid on this auction is $197,500, okay? <laughs> Like, if that ain't the Lord, you know? So I didn't even ask my wife. I'm like, it's God, <laughs> you know? And so I go and I bid on the house. And the next day, I'm like, babe, guess what? <laughs> she hated that house too. She, I was like, guess what? We're homeowners. And I got a house. She's like, what house? I was like, you remember the weird house? And so, but I'm like, so many doors just flew open. I mean, it's one of... I, I look back on, I would just say miracles, you know, $197, $500 ends the next day, so random. And so I'm like, of course, God's just gonna blow these doors open. He's gonna make a way, you know, he's the way maker. And, uh, and, and so we get there, we figure it out. We, you know, it's a, it's a bank owned property. It's been vacant for seven years. Looks like it's been vacant for seven years and it has. And, and so I'm like, this is all gonna go smooth. It's all gonna work out. And then we hit a snag, okay? The bank would not loan money on this house because the foundation. They said, hey, unless you get that foundation repaired, you can't finance this house. And we didn't have that money in cat. We didn't have that money, period. And so we were going to finance the house, get a loan from the bank, and they just wouldn't. And I'm like, no, surely, like God made a way. Well, it came down to, I had to repair the foundation of a house that I didn't own. And so I remember when the foundation people came over and they do this inspection, they bring in this like octopus looking thing. It's got like these 10 tentacles and they put it all over the house and all of the different rooms. And, and they're trying to figure out what's the variation of the foundation. And they're like, hey, this thing from this side of the wall to this side of the wall, it's off 16 inches. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot, I know. And I'm like, can you fix it? And they're like, sure, but you need 27 piers. We've gotta go under this house and put 27 piers. And so we start doing this repair to this house that we don't even own because the bank is wise. 
They know that if you don't repair the foundation of this house, the whole thing could crumble. I mean, the house could literally come crashing down. I mean, it could just fall over and be worthless. And so we need to secure our investment and make sure that this thing is sturdy, that it's not going anywhere. Like, we're great to loan you money against this house, but we need to make sure the house will be there. And so you've got to get the, the foundation repaired, and then you need to do an inspection to make sure that it's going to survive withstand the test of time. And that's what we're gonna do today. As we're wrapping up our series, we're gonna do a foundation inspection report on you, on your faith, on your life. That's how we're ending this series because that's how Jesus ends his sermon. So we're in a series called Upside Down Kingdom where we're going verse by verse, section by section through the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is just hitting us with these illustrations. This was a sermon he gave in about 20 minutes, okay? We're at 11 weeks in, giving you the same kind of breakdown of the ideas of what Jesus taught and expounding on these ideas. And he's all wrapping the whole thing out with talking about foundations. Last week, he talked about the the wide road and the narrow road or the wide gate and the narrow gate. Wide is the road that leads to destruction and many will find it, but narrow is the gate that leads to life and few will find it. Well, he's continuing with this dichotomy. And right after that thought, he says, and there's these two foundations. Let me present them to you. One is built on the rock. That is who? Yes. And one is built on sand. What is that one? I heard lots of different answers, all true, because it's everything else. Anything else you would build your house on, anything else you will build your life on, it's not gonna stand. Here's the deal, you're at church Sunday morning. Of course, I've built my house on Christ. On this solid rock I stand. Oh yeah, I built my house on Christ, of course but you're gonna come face to face with the answer. And here's the thing you cannot do. You can't come to the conclusion this morning, I haven't built my life on Jesus. Now let me walk back to my car and let's go get Tex-Mex and pretend like I have. You can't do that. Okay, that's the one thing I'm asking you right out the gate. I, I'm, I'm begging you, don't do that. And so the, what, what would cause you to do that? Well, gosh, I've been doing this thing for so long. Like everybody knows. And I got the ichthus on my car. And of course, you know, I was a deacon or I was an elder. Or I, you know, I served in this way. I led this ministry. Depart from me. I never knew you. We cast out demons in your name. We prophesied in your name, right? And, and so if we come to that conclusion... You gotta say, all right, what do I need to do now? And for such a time as this, this is how we will wrap up the series, talking about inspecting foundations. I I want you to know that Jesus will not rehab a house unless it's built on the right foundation. So as he goes in to move rooms around and, and adjust things and change habits and do away with addictions and issues, bad thinking patterns. He's not gonna do it unless it's built on the right foundation. As we move through, I'm in Matthew 7, starting in verse 24. We're gonna look at how application determines the foundation, how storms reveal the foundation. And then before you leave here today, we're going to uh, just spend some time doing a foundation inspection report for ourselves. And so I'm gonna give you a minute to to complete that before we wrap up. If you're listening from afar, you'll be able to do that. Uh, Wherever you're at, if you'll just pull over on the side of the road and grab a pen and paper, we will make that happen. I'll, I'll dive in, Matthew 7. He says, therefore, when you see a therefore, you ask, what is it therefore? This is better translated in conclusion, the conclusion of the matter. I'm wrapping up my, my sermon. What you hear me say uh, often is in summary, Okay, in summary, let me move toward the conclusion and wrap up all the things that I'm saying. Everyone who hears these words of mine, what's the words of mine? Whole sermon. 
all, all the things he's been saying for the past 19 minutes, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. This is the outcome we want to avoid at all costs. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. First thing we have to deal with in this text is Jesus is wrapping up, displaying his authority over the law, and so those listening to him are amazed because it's like, who is this man, this carpenter born in Bethlehem who lived in Nazareth? Is that not Joseph's son? How does he say this with such authority? Like he's calling into question what we believe. He's saying anyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't do anything with them. So he's telling the people, his listeners, they're like, hey, you need to, to go back to your camels changed. There has to be something different that comes about you. And then he says there's two foundations to choose from, the rock, Jesus Christ and everything other than Jesus Christ. And in verse 24 and verse 26, it says, everyone who hears these words of mine. And then in 26 it says, but everyone who hears these words of mine. So he's not talking to atheists. He's talking to churchgoers, to God followers, to p the people who are there and they, they hear him. This is not the, the Bushman in Africa. We always talk about the person who never hears. It's not the issue here. These are people who've memorized the Torah. They, they know the Bible. They've got you know, embroidered verses on their letter jackets. It's those people. That's who he's talking to. My first point is application determines the foundation. Application determines the foundation. Both groups here, what's the difference between the two groups? If we look at verse 24, it says, and puts them into practice. And if you look at verse 26, it says, does not put them into practice. The distinctive of the disciple is the application of the words Jesus spoke. That's how you know. That, that determines what your life is built on. What did you do with what you read? What did you do with what you heard? So it's not a, it's not a Google review. It's not a podcast review. It's like, you don't understand, man. I'm podcasting these. I listened to this pot and this pot and this podcast. I went to this church at nine and this church at 11. And I go to this Sunday school just to get a little, you know, and I'm this and I'm in, you know, BSF and BCM and B, you know, all the other acronyms that we can come up with. Right? I've got, got no, 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 it's, it's not more information. You might say I, found, I failed a foundation inspection by 16 inches. Uh, the irony for that in me, we talked about in, in sermon prep this week, is they say, as the slogan goes, as the saying goes, people miss heaven by 16 inches. It's the distance from their head to their heart. But I know a whole lot. Man, I got a seminary degree. I got letters behind my name. So he's talking, I say, but Jesus, we... Matthew 7, last week, says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Wait, what? I thought everyone who said to you, Lord, Lord, like you're telling me it's not just calling you Lord? It's not that? It's something not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Listen, salvation does not come from works but it also does not come without works. 
Your good deeds don't save you, but every saved person is marked by deeds done in the name of the Father. I cannot, I wrote it out so I would say it clearly. I cannot make it more clear for you than that. The altar call in and of itself, it's just words, it's a prayer you said to the air. Unless the Holy Spirit comes into your life and brings about change, he begins to rehab, to reno the house. John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. How do we know if we love you, God? Well, you hear my commands and you do them. You keep them. Matthew 21 is a parable. He says this, there was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. He said, I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. Absolutely, dad, you're the best. I'm, I'm, I'm joyfully do. Hallelujah. Anything you want me to do. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? First, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Who is the you there? Churchgoers. Churchgoers. He says, don't you understand the prostitute on the corner selling herself for money, multiple partners every night is closer to the kingdom of God than the ones who've memorized the verses and sang the songs and done the things and showed up every Sunday. Why so heavy handed, JP? Because he was. I'm reading to you stories Jesus told when he was on the earth to illustrate a point. What's the point? That we would inspect our foundation. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. The tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Uh, I don't want to be placated by my child. You know, I mean, we've got lots of personalities in our house. And we've got the, hey, resist it first, but I'm gonna do what you ask. And we've got the, yes, daddy, absolutely, you're the best, thank you so much. I hit the lottery when it comes to you. And then walk back to the couch, you know, turn on the video came and do nothing. And, and it's, at the end of the day, it's, hey, did you do what I asked you to do? That's what I'm, I'm, that's what I'm looking for, right? A, obedience, faithfulness, walking, in that, the, the Pharisees and the religious people, those listening to Jesus, they measured their righteousness against others. They would find ways out of commitments. They would pray for the approval of others. They would perform spiritual tasks so people would see them disheveling their face, making it look like they're fasting and going through trials and challenges. They would pray as, as others would listen as performance for them. They would give to be noticed and to receive credit. They wanted their names on bricks and on buildings and, and in bulletins. They wanted people to see it. They, they would worry about the future while they said they trusted God. Oh yeah, we believe in God. He's a way maker. He gives all we need. He takes care of the birds and everything. And then their lives just overwhelmed and riddled by worry. It was much easier for them to see the sins of everyone else other people walking with tiny splinters in their eyes while they had forests growing out of their skulls. They couldn't see their own sins. They couldn't see their own shortfalls. They focused, they were, they were driven crazy. They were, they were embittered, they were frustrated, they were on edge because the whole world around me is broken. Why can't everybody be more like me? Why can't they believe what I believe and go where I go and say what I say? I just need them to have my faith. They live for the kingdom on earth, not the kingdom of God. And they were destined for hell. They couldn't hear. Jesus is in front of them telling them the way. 
And they're like, I'll just go back home to a quiet time. He's like, you don't get it. I'm calling you to faithfulness to do everything I've asked you. And they're like, yeah, we got, we want a little bit of you and a whole lot of the world. Like, I'll do that, but I don't want to be crazy. I don't want to take my faith too serious. Can we really understand what the Bible says? You know, I don't want it to influence every single thing that I do. There's no other way. There's no other way. It's it, that's all there is. That's why he's saying these things. James, his brother said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. I met people here. When I say here, I don't mean Waco. I mean here, I mean here, right? I mean here, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, it's so good. Entertainment, who's preaching today? Man, worship was good. And when are we gonna, you know? And it's, it's consumerism. It's what's in it for me mentality and it is so saturating our culture. And it's very different than the biblical call to discipleship, which is faithfulness which is not what's in it for me, but what can I sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, presenting myself as a spiritual act of worship. Lord, take my life and make it mine. Give me a pure heart. What do you want to do? I will lay everything on the altar. I will sacrifice every ounce of my life for you. I got a few years left, Lord until I'm in your presence forever and ever and ever and ever. How can I be poured out like a drink offering? How can I finish this race? Not for your salvation, but from it. Because of what you've done for me. Verse 25, the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. My second point is storms reveal the foundation. Application determines the foundation. What you do with the words of Jesus determines what kind of foundation you have, but you can say, oh, of course, I built my house on Jesus. And when the storm comes, when the tornado rolls in, when the flood waters rise, your foundation is going to be shown for what it is. And you just have to be honest with yourself. You've gotta say, Lord, I can't sleep because I am so consumed with this world. That's the, I am so worried about All the things, God, this is the deal. And he is so, listen, listen. He's so merciful and gracious. That's when he comes, when you have that at, when you're like, God, I'm, I'm so broken. He's like, my child, listen. And that's when he reminds you of the work that he did on your behalf. He's like, I got you. And I've got a spot for you. I've got a glorious inheritance for you. You and I are gonna have the most amazing time in my kingdom. I can't wait to show it to you. It is so beautiful here. You're going to love it. Let's get started today. I got, you don't need to worry about that. I got your children. I've got your finances. Look at the birds of the air. This is what Jesus is coming out of. I don't, you know, have you seen these islands they make in Dubai? You know, where they just like make a palm tree, you know, they just bring in sand. <laughs> have you seen this? You know, it's, a, it's called like, Jeremiah or something. Anyways, it's amazing. If you haven't seen it, Google it. It's pretty incredible. They're just making land. They're just creating real estate to the tune, I think I read, of $12 billion. Well, it turns out I also read it's sinking. They built these houses on this island that they just created out of sand, and they're sinking, you know, $12 billion. Like, and it's like, I'm like, man, you got the best architects and engineers in the Middle East. I'm like, if only they had a Bible, you know? <laughs> They could have turned to Matthew 7. They're like, hey, I think it's a bad idea to build it on sand, you know? It's like, I don't know, guys, right? And if you contrast that with this picture from Gilchrist, Texas, when Hurricane Ike blew in and wiped everything, other one, other picture, everything away, there it is, 
all of the blocks of homes around that one. They called it the last house standing and it got national attention because it just stood so strong right there. And everything, all of the homes around it, there were those, that's a city block. And they're just wiped away and they said, man, what is going on? And then he gave the interview and they said, well, we did a little something different with what, guess what? The foundation, go to the other picture. And it's like, we, we use these reinforced piers and the house held up. And if you go back to the first pic, it, that, that is a picture of you. Because friends, listen, listen, the storm's coming. It's not, it's not in theory, okay? Like the storm is coming. And so let's, let's define some of the terms. The foundation, it's Jesus or anything else, okay? The storm, the, the struggles of this world. I, it, it, there's any number of things we could fill in the blank. The, the storms are the things that you didn't see coming. All of a sudden, man, that looks like a rain cloud and boom, here we are, right? And the great crash, that's what's left with if you built on anything else. So what is the great crash? The great crash is when you start pointing your finger at God and you start blaming him for the things that the devil did in your life and you say, you know what, if you did that, I'm out. And I'm just gonna tell you, if there is anything in your life right now, this is what you gotta hear me on. If there's any aspect of your life, you say, God, you take that away from me and I'm done. Okay, you better believe the demons build a fence around that thing and say, here's where we play. This is it, this is how we get them. I, I heard that, them, I, I know this person, and they said, because what, what's their objective? Number one objective, to get you out of right relationship with God. Number one objective, since the beginning of time, Genesis chapter three, to cause you to question the goodness of God. When you begin to question the goodness of God, you are in demonic, satanic territory. Okay, and so if there's anything in your life where you say, if this happens, you remove this from me, like I'm out, I'll, I'll show up, and you start making these deals, I'll sing the songs, I'll memorize the verses, I'll go to life group, I'll do what they ask, but if you mess with this, I'm out. And that's they're like, all right, here, here's where we're gonna mess around. This way you just gotta be real honest with that stuff. You gotta say, man, here's the thing that I think still has root in my heart. Is it my health? Is it my children? Is it my well-being? Is it my finances? You know, what is, is that thing that you're like, hey, you better not mess with this? Everyone probably knows somebody, everyone here, because it's pretty prominent right now. It may have been, like, I know people that it's like, man, it's who led me to Christ, or, you know, it's, uh, it was my Sunday school teacher, or it was this person I grew up with, and they were so faithful. And, and like now you're, you're going on their Instagram feed or their Twitter, their X feed or their Facebook feed, or you just... Maybe they just ran off into the mountains, isolated, and, and they're like, yeah, and they're just saying crazy stuff. And you're like, what happened? What happened? They started believing some really rogue, like way out there, I don't know, crystals and universal forces, or I don't think there is a guy. They're saying, and you're like, what happened? Where did this go wrong? Here's where it went wrong. They created a deal with God. They didn't have to say it out loud, but they were like, God, I'm gonna do this as long as you do this. And when they perceived that God didn't hold his end of the bargain, they said, you're not good and I'm out. Or they built their faith, not on Jesus, but on some personality. You know, some, some kind of theology that was Jesus and some other things. And they built their life on that. And when the storm came, it didn't hold up. And so they were like, hey, I'm out. And I've seen all of those examples. I don't know which one you're close to, but you can kind of, it does make sense. That's what Jesus is saying. He, he's telling you, hey, this is the way this goes down. And you're like, why? Well, you can't take the Bible too serious. Well, what else are you gonna take serious? Well, Jesus, how do you know about Jesus? It's 66 books that are all about him. It's a collection of his stories. His, the, the life of Jesus is told in here multiple times. What else are we gonna take serious? So Jesus, he's calling us because he loves us to inspect our foundation. Because he's telling you it's gonna be tested. The test could be cancer, a miscarriage, a diagnosis, loss, a prodigal, a relationship that went rogue, an unfaithful spouse, a financial hardship, a crime committed against you, a mental illness, a literal storm, you know, it's like, Man, the tornado wiped us out, or the flood wiped us out, or the hurricane, right? It, it could be a natural disaster. I don't know exactly what it is. Probably something really unfair. 
like probably something you did nothing to deserve and you said, man, why is God doing this to me? God's not doing it to you. Most likely the enemy is doing it to you. A, a demonic army is chasing after you in those ways because there's an idol. There was an idol that grew. And it's like, if God loves us, why wouldn't he tell us that in this world we will have trouble? He did. He did. I'm like embarrassed to share with you what came to mind when I was looking at this. And it was like, like I thought about all the things that it wasn't. Like it wasn't when we thought we lost a child. It, it wasn't when I went through this season of intense anxiety and panic attacks. It wasn't when my father passed away. It wasn't when um, just like 2020, all the leadership challenges around that. It's, it's really silly what it was, but I remember being brought to that place where I questioned if God is good or not. And that's what we're talking about. That's what the enemy's after. He wants you to question is, is God good? Did God really say, can you trust him? Same offense from the beginning of time. And for me, I had bought a car a car I loved, a worldly thing. And I, I bought it, I had the title, I met with the guy, all the things, and it's there at my house, and it turns out it was stolen. It was a stolen car. And when you buy a stolen car, I can tell you from experience, just in case you're wondering what happens, they just come and take it. <laughs> they just come and load it up on the back of the trailer, and they drive all, they say, is this your car? You say, yes. They say, did you steal it? You say, no. They say, well, it is stolen. You say, man, that's really unfortunate. And they say, it's now ours. And, and they, I remember them driving off down the road with my car on the back of, of the trailer. And I thought, man, it's gone. Like the blessing, the hand of the Lord, the anointing. Because What was the idol? It was the deal. It was the deal for me. Like, I loved the deal. I was always chasing the deal. I thought I had the golden touch, you know, and I, can, I found this smoking deal on a car. Turns out it had a reason to be so cheap. <laughs> and they just drove off with it. And, and in that weird moment, that was the thing where I was just like, God, are you really good? Like, why, why would you allow this to happen? What are you doing to me? And I, I turned on him in that moment. And I don't know what it is for you. I mean, that's silly. It, it's silly because of the things that it could have been. And I think it, it exposed me. I think it exposed the idol of, of money. I think it exposed the idol of the deal. I think it exposed you know, the, this deal that I made with God that I didn't know I made. If you're here and you're in the storm, like this is the comfort I wanna give you. The storm does not mean you've built on the wrong foundation. The, the storm is the certainty. The storm comes to those who build on the rock and those who build on sand. The storm's coming. The storm's coming for all of us. Some of you are in a storm right now. Like storms are a certainty. And the foundation is determined by what you do in the storm, what you believe about God in the storm. So if you're in the storm, hold on and fill your heart and your mind with the truths of God that he's good right? It, it, the deal that he made with you, it's probably not the deal like, hey, if you're really good, then I'll give you good kids in a good neighborhood at a good school with good grades. That's not the deal he's making. The deal he's making, hey, is if you live a life surrendered to me, you trust in the death and the resurrection of my son, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, I give you heaven forever and ever, not 76 years and not 76,000 years and not 76 billion years, not 76 trillion years, but forever and ever and ever, you're in, in my presence with me in my kingdom. That's not broken. And I'm just like, when did heaven stop being enough for us? When was it like, hey, I want that, but, but all this other stuff. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna inspect our foundation. And so pull out your phone, we're gonna use some technology to do this. If you're to totally te technology adverse, you're like, my phone, I leave that in the car because it's church, that's awesome. And there's, there's a pen and paper around you. Um, there's a flow code behind me right there. You can just point your camera at that and a little survey is going to come up. And if you're listening, I'll read through the questions, if you're just listening from somewhere else, I will read through these questions. And all you need to do is write down a, a numerical value of one to 10 for each question. It's 10 questions 
and 10 is like, hey, this is most true about me, and one is this is least true about me. And so if you, and then we're just gonna add them up. And so this is the inspection report. Now what these things are, Jesus said, whoever heard these words of, here's these words of mine. So this is the Sermon on the Mount broken up. So this is when we looked at it and we tried to break it up section by section, theme by theme, that's what these this 10 sections are. It also is a, a great recap of where we've been in case you're here with us for the first time. And so you can take that at your own pace on your phone, and I'll just read them to you. Your life is marked by humility. You would write anywhere from a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten. I'm, I'm super humble. Um, one, not really. You regularly share the gospel. I did yesterday, the day before, every day, multiple times a day. I'm a ten. You rid your mind of lustful thoughts. You have control over your anger. You keep your commitments. I always do what I say I'm gonna do. You eagerly seek forgiveness and forgive others. I'm not marked by desire for revenge. Grace comes easy to me. Uh, humility, asking for forgiveness, easy. You pray fast and give regularly. So if you got prayer and giving but not fasting, you're kinda starting at a six. You pray fast and give regularly. You don't worry about the future, Matthew 6, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. You focus on your own sins more than the sins of others. You live for the kingdom of God and not the kingdoms of this world. And so these are the 10 questions. I'm just gonna give you a minute to pray through that. So if you finish, just look at that, look at where you struggle and pray. What's low? As you add those up, it's gonna give you a grade, one to 100. You kinda of see, hey, am I passing here? It's not a perfect science, it's an inspection tool. I think we all kind of assume, like, of course, like my foundation, it's built on Christ. But I think we overlook his words. If you do what I said, hard things like love your enemies, Turn the other cheek, forgive. In summary, your foundation is determined by application. The storms reveal the foundation. And now you're leaving here with an inspection report. I would consider sending that to your life group and saying, hey, let's discuss this or here are the areas. You know, I would especially send the ones you most don't want to send. Does that make sense? <laughs> Like there's a part of you like, oh, I really don't wanna do that. We're not that close, I don't know them that well. All of that just means you absolutely should, for sure, do that. And then take that next step of, hey, can we discuss this? This is where I need to struggle. And let me just tell you, if there's that person in your life group and you think, man, I'm not even sure if they're saved, and they show up with a 90 and you show up with a 60, you're gonna have a hard time in that. God's in that, he's gonna, he's gonna work on your heart in that, okay? That's about you. Well, that's about you, and he's gonna help you in and through that. That house we bought at the beginning, I was telling you, it had been vacant seven years, and it looked like it had been vacant seven years. Like it, there were cracks, there were rats, there was mold, it smelled bad, there was a leak underneath the house that had just been leaking for who knows how long. Uh, there were all kinds of problems with the house. Why? Because no one lived there. No one lived there. And so when we repaired the foundation and we were able to close on the house and take possession, what we did is we began to bring that house back to life. Now, if we took possession and we did nothing, that would confuse the neighbors. They would wonder, did they move in? Well, what are they doing? Is it, did, they, did they take possession? Are they actually living there? It's odd that they haven't mowed the yard yet. But because we lived there, we began to make it new. We began to change some things. Right, and it's amazing what God did there. We, you, four guys moved in with us, and we were, it was like a discipleship hub. The girls were either born there and grew up there. I mean, they were there until kindergarten, our daughters, and there's this, these guys that lived on the other side of the wall. They call them the guys on the other side of the wall. It's like a horror movie. And, they were, you know, and it was just, it was beautiful. And then when they moved out, this other couple, this newly married couple moved in with us, and there was just this discipleship that was happening in that home as we brought it back to life. But if there's not change, 
then it would be fair to ask, does anyone live there? And if you're like, hey, like the Dodgers vomit, you continue these same things and there's not really change and you're living for the world, I think it's really fair to ask, does someone live here? And in the way that I repaired uh, uh, the foundation of a house I didn't own, I'm telling you, Jesus won't do that. Jesus has to have the house to repair the foundation. He says, that one's mine. And he paid for the house with his blood on the cross. And then when Jesus takes possession of the house, when his Holy Spirit moves into a home, he begins to renovate his demo day. This is what C.S. Lewis says in Mere Christianity. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He is getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing and so you're not surprised by that. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage. He is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. It's, it's very simple. It's very simple. When the Holy Spirit starts making you to a heavenly home it's because he lives there and when he doesn't it's because he doesn't and if that creates some insecurity or strange questions or you need help or prayer like let's talk I'm not trying to upset you but I'm very much trying to bring you to a fork in the road where you say am I going to go this way or am I going to go that way these aren't my words. These aren't JP's words. I'm not preaching for effect or firing for effect. These are the words of Jesus that I'm putting in front of you multiple ways and multiple times and trying to explain them. And I think we have to separate the words from Jesus from Christianity as we know and understand it in America because I think they're different in most cases. I think they're different. So let me just pray for us. Father, would you help us Help us to know what is true and what is not. Help us to discern the teachings of Jesus. I pray for the person who knows you and is walking with you that this message would be a comfortable blanket of assurance that your work is alive and well in their life. And for the person who is striking superstitious deals with you of religion, uh, the person who has embraced a mindset of, I'm saved so I can do whatever I want, I pray that this would be a cactus, sandpaper, that it would be, it would be a sweater that doesn't fit until it brings about a change, starting with our hearts, starting with our foundation, that we would trust in your son, his work, his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.